will be adorned with gold. She will be the wealthiest religion in world history. There will be so much wealth coming related to her influence because, remember, there's peace and safety. The wars have ceased, but only for a minute. That could be a few years, but only for a minute. So there's new economy. There's unity in nations. The economic climate has been uh, corrected. Peace has been settled. She looks purple. She looks royal. She's dignified. She's adorned with gold. She's wealthy. But more than that, she has a golden cup in her hand. She has, she's committed to humanitarian service. The cup is always in the Bible uh, is a, uh, a symbol of service. She's serving the nations with this wealthy golden cup. She's using her wealth to benefit the earth. I mean, what a great story if it ended there. But the angel says, John, put on your seatbelt. Because she's full of abomination at her heart level. John's like, wow. Because this is the first time the heart of Babylon religion has been revealed so directly. He goes, she has a golden cup. She looks like she's serving. She's wealthier than any religion in history because just of the, the collective power. She's got the favor of all the kings. She has dignity and honor. But at her heart, she's full of abomination. And at her heart, she's full of filthiness. Now, I have this in the notes, so I'm not, you'll find it if you want to read it later. I have these descriptions in, uh, in the notes. But to be filled with abomination is an Old Testament term. It's a very clear Old Testament term, and, and John was an Old Testament scholar. He understood what abomination meant. We don't find a new term for abomination. It's what the Bible calls abomination, and that's related to false gods and demons. Abomination is related to demons, Worshiping demons and false gods. Worshiping idols is always worshiping demons. According to 1 Corinthians 10, Paul the Apostle said, when they worship those idols, they don't know it. They're worshiping demons. They don't know it, but they are. So Paul, the angel's telling John, he says, when they're this golden cup, they're serving the nations. They're using their wealth, quote, for the benefit of so many underprivileged people that are oppressed. You got to know that at the core She's filled with abomination. She is being driven by demons. Oh, what a difficult message to say this in that hour. And at the core, she's filthy. There will be sexual perversion beyond anything that we've seen in this hour. Far beyond what we see now. That will all be applauded and endorsed by this world religion. And everybody will go, well, you know, if billions say it's right, all the kings of the earth agree, all the preachers of this religion say that's what God says is okay, then, hey, freedom. That's what they'll call it. God calls it filthiness. There will be perversion beyond anything we can imagine on a global level. At the same time, the church will be growing in the glory of God in purity. It will be a stark contrast like never before in history. Verse 5. John says on her head, she has a name. He goes, when you get her name, you'll understand what's going on behind her. Her name's Babylon. Because I'm not going to go into it right now. What the angel's telling John, trace this religion back to Genesis 11, the Tower of Babel, the first organized religion in human history. He goes, it began there. Genesis 11, the Tower of Babel, the city of Babel, for which they... Uh, uh, derive the name Babylon later was the first organized religion in history, Genesis 11, and it was the first organized rebellion against God in history. And the angel says, if you want to find the root system to this global movement, this tree that sprung up and its branches touched the whole world, go back to Genesis 11, and he's giving John insight. And that's a, that's a lot, that's a giant point, and there's a lot to say about that, but that's not my point in this session. It's just a point to it. Her name is Mystery Babylon, the mother of harlots. She's the source of all the false religions in history, and she's the source of this new global religion. Now look at verse 6. Here's the point I made earlier. This religion will be drunk with the blood of the saints. I don't mean she will disagree with the saints. She will be intoxicated 
with the idea of murdering. This will be a humanistic movement that esteems the value of human beings, but at the same time will murder the saints. They will say, why? How could, how the, why the contradiction? You have such value of human life, because it will all put, it will all be value, 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 everybody's right, everybody's valued, and the value part is right, but it will be encased in a lie. Why are you so enraged, drunk with murdering the saints? Because the saints are the only people in the world that are in the way from a permanent, abiding world peace. Because they keep saying, it's evil what we're doing. And they have power when they say it, because they heal the sick and raise the dead and cast out demons. There will be power on the church like no time in history. And many people will be turning to the church. The church will be growing rapidly. So the leaders of Harlot Babylon will say, well, she's telling the church is, is telling the nations we're of the devil and we're perverse. We're not perverse, we're liberated. It's not perversion, it's not filthiness. It's called love, it's true love. Who is she to tell us what love is? And number two, not only is she telling everybody that we're the church, telling everybody that we're evil and we're perverse, she's telling everybody we're going to be judged by God in a minute. So we got to get rid of that voice. To be drunk with blood means the more they kill, the bolder they get. You know, you've heard the, the uh, term through... Uh, Different uh, uh, nations that had genocide, you know, where the wars like in Rwanda and uh, places like that, where the genocide is occurring in the nation, they call it bloodlust. Where the people, of course, they're on drugs and alcohol, but more than alcohol, on drugs. And the more they kill, the more emboldened they get to kill. Something, a euphoria, of course, we know it's a demon, comes over them and something stronger gets in them to kill more. It's bloodlust is what some have called it. John, the angel calls it drunk with blood. They will be so bold to kill. They will, the kings will agree with it. Can you imagine the kings of the earth? The wealthy man, the great merchants of the earth, the, the great power, uh, 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 powerful men in the, and women in the uh, financial sector of the earth, they will say, kill them. The kings will say, kill them. The religious leaders, of course, they'll all ascribe to this harlot Babylon, kill them, you'll have God's favor. The nations will say, okay, kill them, we will. And this is the context of the great falling away. Because many believers are going to get stronger and stronger with the Lord, but other believers are going to say, you know, I sort of liked Christianity. I mean, I was sincere, but I don't know if I'm that sincere, and it will be a great divide, but the church will be absolutely purified in this hour. If you're not willing to die for him, then you will declare it. Nah, you know what? I'm not really into that. I mean, I love Jesus. And I grew up with Jesus and my religion. And I don't want to be that extreme. Besides, we've prayed for peace and unity and prosperity, and it's happening. Maybe this is the real thing, and maybe the Christian thing was a little bit stringent. Beloved, it's the hour now to train our 15-year-olds and our 5-year-olds about allegiance to Jesus. It's the hour now to train them before they go to the college campus in 10 or 15 years, to train them now about this subtle lie that's filling the airways already. We don't want them to get to college, go to a Bible study that is a Bible study in name only. It's not even talking about the Jesus of the Bible. It's the new Jesus that everybody likes. I'm not, I mean, the false religions, they'll talk about Jesus. We honor Jesus. Well, who, what Jesus do you honor? Well, you know, a great teacher, great prophet. No, no. More. Yeah, he is a great teacher, great prophet. The greatest. More. Fully God. The only man that's God. Whoa. The only way of salvation. Ouch. And he alone has the right to define righteousness and love. And he says what's going on over there is not love, it's perversion. They go, whoa, now you're stepping over the line. That's not the Jesus we're having a Bible study about. Beloved, they're not in a Bible study with Jesus. I'm talking about Christians will end up in that. That's happening today. Imagine 10, 20 years from now. I have four grandchildren. You know, 15, 20 years, they'll be in the college years. And I, I want an environment in the church, not just for them. I care about Jesus, not just my grandkids, but I do like my grandkids. 
I mean, if you saw them, you, well, never mind. And so, it's remarkable. Okay, let's speed up. Let's go to D, top of page three. I need to bring this to an end in a, a moment here, a few moments. You can kind of read the notes, the things I've said the last 10 minutes. I have them written out, a lot of the key points. Paragraph D, Daniel 8, 23. The heart of Babylon will inspire the nations. I mean, I'm using the word inspire to new heights of sin and demonic activity beyond anything they've ever done before. Daniel the prophet saw it. He said, in the latter time, of their kingdom. He's talking about these kingdoms that will come to a culmination in the generation the Lord returns. You got to read all of Daniel 8 to understand what it means of their kingdom. He's talking about these world kingdoms that come to a culmination at one time together in the generation the Lord returns. He says at that time, sin, transgression, you can use either, any word, either word, will reach its fullness. Sin on a global level will reach its fullness. Sin has never reached fullness on a global level. There have been individuals that have reached fullness, but not globally. Revelation 14, 10, I have it written there in the notes. The angel told John, sin is going to be totally ripe. Ooh, what a terrifying phrase. Right, it'll be completely ripe. Sin is becoming ripe globally, but it's not there yet. Sin is increasing, but it has not reached fullness. Not yet. It's increasing. The internet's helping it, but the internet's also, Jesus is the Lord of the internet. He's also, the internet's being used for light, but the internet is being used, I'll just talk about the dark side of the internet, because there's a positive side of the internet that's awesome of what the Lord's doing with the internet, but the internet is bringing perversion to a global level at, at a speed and a depth unforeseen in history. I mean, we, we got the situation now where much of the earth Little 10-year-old boys and girls can see things in the pornography realm all over the earth. But it's going to go beyond that. Because the internet, the technology thing, is going to go beyond uh, a, a picture on a screen. There's going to be the interactive technology that's coming just down the road. Where they won't just see a picture on a screen. There will be the apparently people with light and, and uh, through technology, doing all kinds of things. Anyway, that's, I'm stepping out there a little bit, but it's already in the technology books. Where is sexual perversion going when that happens? I mean, sexual perversion next 20, 30, 40 years through the internet and the advanced technology, we can't fathom where it's going, but then so is the occult and so is murder going to reach those levels too. Well, it says this, that in the latter times, when the transgressors reach their fullness on a global level, a king will arise. So the sin has reached its level before the king arises. The king's the Antichrist. Because that Romans 8, I mean, uh, Daniel 8 is about the Antichrist, a very graphic description of him. But even before the king arises in the harlot Babylon era, Sin arises and reaches a level beyond anything we've ever seen in history. Okay, let's uh, look at where I want to go. Let's look at paragraph G. Paragraph G. Now, this is a strange verse. If you've not read it before, you might go, huh, like, give me a minute. But if you take a few minutes on it, it will be apparent what I'm going to say. It's a little bit, it's symbolic, but it's not so hard to figure out because the angel tells John what the symbol means. He saw the harlot religion sitting on the Antichrist. Okay? So the harlot religion is sitting on the Antichrist. Verse 7. And this woman, there's a mystery. There's an unusual dynamic that's not predictable that surprises you. Because John in the next verse goes, I'm totally surprised. He goes, there's a mystery, something you would not have guessed. The woman and the beast, the harlot religion and the Antichrist have a strange relationship and she's going to sit on him and he's going to carry her for a season. He's going to be the support system to her. This is before he comes in world power. 
He's going to be apparently on her team. 